Good morning, everybody. It's Bernard Nomberg. It's Tuesday morning. It is time for another weekly episode of Nomberg Law Live. And as I like to say each week, we bring interesting conversations with people in their areas of expertise. And today's topic and my guest is of particular interest. It deals with collegiate sports. I've got Jay Smith, local attorney with Brockwell Smith. Good morning, Jay. How are you doing? Good morning, Bernard. Thanks for having me. Well, you and I are about to jump into the wild, wild west, aren't we? Indeed, indeed. There's a lot of unknowns out there, which kind of makes it fun, I think. It, 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 it is. And what we're talking about, guys, is name, image, and likeness. You've probably heard that term. You've probably seen it in the news in the last year or two. We're going to get into what it means and what's going on with collegiate sports, because it has changed the landscape of how sports are run now and how the NCAA is having to deal with it or not deal with it. I don't know if they're putting their head in the sand like an ostrich or they're, they're dealing with it, but Jay, I guess let's start with broad strokes. What, is, what does that term in its general sense mean, name, image, and likeness? Well, in the context of the NCAA and college sports and really sports in general and much broader than that, it's important to, to start with a foundation of what what the players could not do with their own names, with their own image, with their own likeness while they were in school. And this goes back, you know, just a year or so ago mm -hmm. that to sum it up, the player couldn't make money on his own name, image, or likeness, or really overall when he or she was in school. And now there has been sort of a push for a change in both legislation and, and, and particularly I think with the proliferation of, social media accounts and people's uh, student athletes being able to push their brand a little bit on their own. They have a little more power in that regard. Um, you know, that there's been some pressure to change. So you asked a question, what does NIL name, image, and likeness mean? It, it means now that a college player has a right to use his own name, his own image, and uh, while he's playing to, to make money for him or herself. Jay, in the last, I don't know, 60, 70 years with collegiate sports, we hear and we, we've read about all of the big stories that make the headlines. Somebody, for example, when SMU with Ponygate in the 80s shut down their program because players of enticements to come to the school are getting cars, cash, et cetera. That's well documented in many, any area, many areas. Does name, image, and likeness, is it supposed to um, deal with that? Now, before you answer that, 35, 40 years ago, we had no internet. We had no such thing as branding of student athletes, et cetera, no social media, things like that. But those kind of stories, the SMU story being one of the biggest ones that are historically does name, image, and likeness now address those issues? Here's a lawyer answer for you, Bernard. Yes and no. Um, I only expect lawyer answers. <laughs> right. They're, they're sometimes the best answers, sometimes the worst answers. So uh, uh, Alabama fans, of which I admittedly am one, are more familiar with the Albert Means situation where and, and it was somewhat similar to the SMU situation way back in the day, to the extent I, I remember what that was about, the NIL, the, the opening up of the NIL rules doesn't necessarily address that. In other words, boosters can't give money to players to come and play at the University of Alabama, at Southern Methodist University. It can't work like that. What NIL means is that the student ha now has a right, student athlete now has a right to use his or her own image to make money. Mm -hmm. But again, that is, to, that is to be distinguished from pay for play, meaning Albert, you know, um, um, athlete John Smith, you come to play for Alabama and we'll pay you $100,000. It, it cannot be couched like that. Now, clearly, there are ways to, to sort of work around the prohibition on pay for play, I imagine, and those are coming down the pike for sure. Um, but the NCAA and almost all the state legislation has been careful not to allow 
pay for play, meaning schools certainly can't pay any student athlete to come and play for them, nor can boosters, nor can school sponsors, et cetera. So there are still several restrictions, but um, there are also a lot of windows and of opportunity for the student athlete. Well, and Jay, just to be clear, we're only talking about the student athlete who's in college. We're not talking about high school or junior high. As much as, as, much as that makes me cringe, I know it's out there in some, some form, maybe not recognized or, or should be, but we're just talking about college, correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, the new NIL laws apply only to collegiate athletes, I, I, I think is right. Um, and maybe we'll talk some about sort of the evolution of these laws. I mean, I don't know how far in the weeds you want well, to get on that. I personally find it interesting. Um, it, it, it's No, it's, it's very interesting because I know that this started on this in different states levels to, to put the pressure on the NCAA. So if you would just give us a little bit of that background and what did it force the NCAA, which is supposedly the governing body of, of collegiate sports, but we all know that there's issues too much for this conversation, but give us a little bit of that genesis, if you will. So California, oddly enough, was the first state to really put pressure on the NCAA. So again, prior to 2019, there were no laws on the books that conflicted with the NCAA's prohibition of pay for play. Um, or, or let me state it more broadly than that. NCAA's prohibition for making money in any respect while a student athlete was in college. So California comes along and they pass a law in 2019 called the Fair Pay to Play Act or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that law sort of opened the door for students to make money, student athletes to make money while they're in school. And, but, but here's the thing that although that law was made in 2019, it wasn't supposed to go into effect until 2023 or something like that. So the NCAA then sort of took their cue, which, you know, this has sort of been simmering for a while, Bernard. I, I don't know if you remember all this discussion about the NCAA being, uh, you know, the only multi-billion dollar industry in the world in which the people who made, uh, were responsible for making a lot of that money couldn't, couldn't see a cent of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are diff differing opinions on um, the fairness of, of that. But anyway, Right after California made its law, then the NCAA basically said, hey, we, we need to do something because th this is this is going to be a snowball effect. And so the NCAA po appoints a committee to, you know, come up with rules that were, you know, in their view, fair for kids to maybe potentially use their NIL to make money. But things didn't go exactly as the NCAA wanted them to go, I don't think, because other states, including our fine state, Bernard, uh, came in and said, we want to push this. And they made no bones about it, particularly the SEC schools, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, especially, said, you know, we don't we want to take advantage of this from a recruiting standpoint. And they they were very explicit about it to 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 the state legislature's credit. You know, they said, we, we want to do this so that we, we are not at a recruiting disadvantage. Yeah. You know, a lot of times they'll couch their rationale and some sort of grander purpose, but they were very explicit, which I personally found uh, admirable. <laughs> so They we all just, knew what it was about. This right, finally exactly. they said it. <laughs> exactly. So, and so now what you've got is sort of a hodgepodge of different state laws that the NCAA thought, oh, no, I mean, how in the world are we going to manage all this? We, perhaps we will become obsolete at some point as a governing body if all states have their own NIL laws that are more that are excuse me less restrictive than the NCAA's would have been. So fast forward a little bit to, to July 2020. I think I think that's right. I think that that's when the NCAA sort of begged Congress. Congress come up with a federal uniform law that will make things easier to manage. Um, and then from that point forward, federal bills started popping up. Some of them were just like, I think, I think, let me give you an example of 
one example I found interesting. Oregon's law basically said that, and remember, Oregon is a huge Nike school. You know, they get a bunch of money from Nike every year. Oregon's law went so far to say that universities had to pay their students part of the royalties that they received for existing contracts, regardless of whether the students were involved with them or not. So in other words, regardless of whether the students' names were actually used in connection with that sponsorship deal. So that's when the NCAA really started panicking, you know, because now you've got a, a, not only a fairness deal, but now it's starting to uh, chip away at their, their each um, member school's uh, revenue. So that was sort of a panic moment for the NCAA. And then there's this Alston v. NCAA case. It was a Ninth Circuit case. It didn't really, from what I can tell, doesn't really have anything to do specifically with NIL rights. It's more of does does an NCAA member institution have to follow antitrust law? Or is the mere fact that they have an academic mission, are they exempt from antitrust requirements? Supreme Court said, no, you are not exempt. That case is appealed and basically affirmed. With the result of that appeal, now the NCAA says, I think that, let's see, I'm looking at a timeline here I wrote down for, for this um, Facebook Live show <laughs> that says, in June 2021, the Supreme Court denied the Austin appeal. And not only did it do that, the Supreme Court basically told the NCAA, if you start adopting more restrictive NIL laws, if they're too restrictive, we're going to strike them down. So as at that point, the NCAA, I think, just sort of threw up its hands and say, said, we're going to allow NIL, use of NIL, and it's sort of every man for himself, every state for itself, until the feds come in. And the feds haven't come in yet. I mean, we can get to that in a little bit. Um, so well, again, you, you mentioned Wild Wild West earlier. Yeah. That's kind of where we are now. Well, it's, it's and guys, if you're just joining us or, or you're watching us on the replay later on, talking with Jay Smith with Brockwell Smith Law Firm here in Birmingham, we're talking about name, image, and likeness and how it is changing the landscape extremely quickly of collegiate sports. Now, student athletes, regardless of the sport, can get paid for their name, their image, or their likeness while they're eligible for NCAA uh, competition. And it's, it's very interesting, Jay. I want to pivot for just a minute to talk a little bit about some of the, the initial uh, deals that have been reported. You've got uh, twin girl basketball players out of Fresno with a huge phone deal. The LSU gymnast, gymnast, a big deal. There was a rapper's son who I think plays basketball to like, it was reported $2 million. It's yep. been reported, but I, I don't want to, I know you've got some specific ones, but it really is kind of eye popping, not just small five figure deals or even six figure deals here, but tell us a little bit of some of the more notable ones that you've seen. Well, the Bryce Young example, me being a, a perhaps a homer uh, from time to time, and it, you know, the the students are required to report these contracts to the respective university, and the university, in theory, at least in Alabama, and I think in most NIL states, has the right to review um, those contracts. Now, do they have ultimate approval authority? Uh, we'll see about that. I, I'm not sure whether they do or not. Um, so I, I think if one wanted to know what these deals were, perhaps you could get it from freedom of information request. I don't know if that's really been fleshed out yet, but Bryce Young is probably the most famous one locally. I saw a stat that this first year, remember, we are in the infancy of NCAA NIL rules. 1.5 billion in deals. And this, this stat came, I think I found it last month online. And if you do a little math on that, that equals to about $3,000 per student athlete nationwide. Now, 
they're not seeing that. Not not every student is seeing that, but that gives you some idea of even in its first year, how much money we're talking about. I'm talking about the bench player on, yeah. you know, a, a, an equestrian team that you've never heard of. Yeah. Um, I saw another stat where over 80% of the NIL deals on the book now are worth less than $100. <laughs> so that tells you, you know, there's some disparity. The haves and the have nots. Yes, in terms yeah. of earning potential, which, you know, again, teams like Alabama, teams like, you know, the, the bigger name teams will certainly be sure. able to take advantage of that. Sure. But there were estimates that the top athletes, when, when the market really opens up, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that, that are unsure, a lot of businesses that are unsure about getting their toes in these waters because there's so much uncertainty around the law. So the point we mentioned earlier, where folks expect Congress, U.S. Congress come in and, and yeah. say, okay, we're going to preempt all these weird state laws, unusual state laws mm -hmm. with the rules of our own. So when there's more confidence about um, yeah. the marketplace, estimates expect, you know, an athlete to make up north of six million a year. That is incredible. So we're not even close by some estimates to where we will be. It, it, Jay, one of the things that has initially struck me, obviously, with us being in Alabama and, and Alabama being such a, a, an accomplished football program for so many years, the position of the, the QB1, Bryce Young, that's one of the glamour positions in all of collegiate sports. And it has been for years. And without going back through any of that history, it's been reported that Bryce Young is, is, has a million dollar NIL deal. And uniquely, I, I looked up Bill O'Brien, his quarterback's coach, who he meets with every day. He's making, his salary is $1.1 million. <laughs> and if you really think about this, I can understand it on the NFL, the professional level. Tom Brady's making, I don't know, 30, 40, whatever he's making. And his QB coach is making a fraction of that. But that's professional. And it's been that way for decades. But now you have a 19-year-old boy who's just still developing on the collegiate level. He'll probably play pros in a few years. He's making the same kind of money. He may even have other deals I don't know about. As his own quarterback's coach, I'm wondering – and I know this is speculation on our part, does that change the dynamics in that room uh, for some student athlete and their coach? I don't think there's any question um, that you can imagine, you know, the NFL, this is a problem in the NFL all the time, at least from what we hear on, on ESPN and sports talk shows that when the athlete believes he or she is more dispensable than the coach. Perhaps there are problems that way. Now, from what I've heard about Bryce Young, anecdotally, he seems like a decent kid, so maybe it's not so much a problem for him, but you, you raise a good point. Who knows what dynamic uh, that's going to create in, in a position room where, you know, you have a, a great receiver at a university who's making as much as his coach is. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm glad I don't have to deal with it, Bernard. Yeah, I, I, Nick, you're, you're right about the Alabama situation. I, I seriously doubt that Coach Saban would create or allow for any type of environment where that could percolate between and create the, 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 the change of dynamics. But you're right. There are so many. I can see a, somebody who has the personality, I'll call him a prima donna basketball player or a pitcher who thinks he's better than or a gymnast who has all these I can see where personalities are going to clash, but yeah. let's get back to not the unique, not the big time deals that we've referenced, but what's the realistic, what, what, what are some of the realistic deals, the more let's bring them back down to reality that you're aware of, whether they're in state or, or otherwise, that really is the 80%, not the 20%. Right. Well, my firm represents a lot of small businesses and, and mid-sized businesses in Alabama. So I've, I've had a chance to talk to several people about how this really works on the ground. You know, again, we're not talking about the Bryce Youngs of the world. We're talking about 
second string um, offensive lineman from Trustful who has a bunch of Twitter followers, you know, that's more like, you know, you, you get maybe they pair up with a small business like a restaurant, for instance, and they say, hey, I'll, I'll post one time a month talking about how good, you know, X, Y, Z restaurant is and maybe wear a shirt or something like that. And you pay me $500 or something like that for every, every post. That's not a terribly unusual deal. It'd be a decent deal from, from a college kid's perspective. Um, there's an, I think Arkansas, I think it was Arkansas, their whole offensive line paired with like a, a restaurant, which I thought was a match made in heaven, you know, get, get the, the big boys to go sit at a table where they, they can barely fit in and put a big mound of food in front of them, let them go to work. Put, put that online that seemed to, yeah. that seemed to make sense for me but yeah it's it's and and again Bernard we're, we're in the infancy one would think there would be a lot of oversight that these players would have a lot of direction as to what they can do what they can't do and I'm sure they get that to some degree but the local sort of small mom and pop shops their experience with these athletes has been anything but that yeah. you know it's amazing what the kids don't really know. And in fact, I'm trying to advise these businesses, hey, if you violate Alabama's NIL Act, you're the one that's in trouble. Yeah. Um, so kid. you got, you know, you kind of be, be, be a little careful because the student athlete, I don't, I don't think the NIL law was designed to punish the student athlete for maybe an inadvertent violation. But and we're talking like a class C felony. Um, that at least in accordance with NIL, Alabama's NIL law, that anyone who violates it, who's not a student athlete, could be guilty for. So, you know, tread lightly. Yeah. That advice. Jay, let me ask you that from this, that the logistics, are the businesses, do they pay the student athlete directly? Yeah. Or do they go through a, a, a third party of any sort, or like an agent? Typically, you know, the small business that I'm talking about Typically, this is not always true, but typically they would be dealing with a, um, a college athlete that does not yet have an agent. Mm -hmm. Because remember, before this NIL law was passed, college student athletes could not have agents by right. definition, because right. that sort of removed them from the amateur status. However, they can hire agents now for the purpose of reviewing these NIL laws. In fact, I mean, I don't want to parse too much, but they don't even have to hire agents. They can just hire attorneys who aren't registered agents. Um, to review these contracts. So typically the money goes straight from the business to the student athlete in the smaller deals. However, if there is an agent involved, it can go through like their trust account and then they'll pay, sure, the, sure. They'll pay the player. And I could see where if that's the situation, the student athlete who's not knowledgeable or keeps up with their tax responsibilities, they could then end up getting in trouble if they don't report that as, as income. So Absolutely. There's, there's so many issues uh, here that I'm sure those who, like yourself, who do this every day, probably a new issue every day, if not multiple issues, you've got to figure out how to solve them or what to do with them. Well, particularly with the sort of the hodgepodge of laws that I keep referring to, I mean, until maybe the feds come in and come up with a more uniform law, uh, what, what is interesting to, to your point earlier about the tax implications that, you know, young high school kids or young college kids wouldn't have any clue about, at least I did when I was in college. Um, the schools are supposed to provide training for their student athletes NIL yep. deals. You know, whether or not that has actually happened, I don't know. I, I, at least my business clients don't really get the sense that their, their pro prospective NIL student athletes have, have gotten much training, but maybe that's down the pike. It may be, even in, the, in the, most of the Power Five schools, it's probably a situation, except for some of the elite programs, the bigger programs. If you're approached with a potential NIL, they'll come see us. We'll advise you how to deal with it. Otherwise, you, you don't need to stop by our department. <laughs> for yeah, that. right. But what about... And, and and with the with the onset and the onslaught of social media, when you have the Zion Williamsons of the world while they're still in high school, 
with 2 million Instagram followers, et cetera. That's got to be very attractive to the barbecue places and the, the car dealerships for when that student athlete lands at X school, there's the audience right there. So I would assume that that's what these high school kids who are wanting to play at the next level, that's why they want to build up their brand as much as, as possible. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. It, it, it sort of social media presence mm -hmm. has almost made it quantifiable for the student athlete to say, hey, I've got this many followers, therefore I should be worth a lot. Now what that number is, who knows? I mean, only a, maybe a sports agency or somebody like that could, could really provide a good appraisal of that. But the student athlete now has leverage. Mm -hmm. I can go to you know, an auto dealership and say, hey, if you let me post something, here's how, here's how much traction I get. Now, yeah. the flip side of that is the car dealership better check that student athlete's social media feed mm -hmm. to see if he posts, he or she posts anything that they may not want to be associated with. Yeah. You know, there's that game too, I suppose. No, there, there certainly is. And you, you don't even have to be, like you mentioned earlier, you don't even have to be a starter at a big time program. If you have a, a large social media following, you've got the student athlete, I would think now has some leverage that they ordinarily wouldn't. But what about this scenario, Jay? And this is for the businesses that want to go into business with these student athletes. What if the athlete who they have a deal with gets hurt and their eligibility, I mean, then they stop playing or their eligibility is revoked for some other unrelated reason. They cheated on a test. I, I don't know, I'm making something up. And again, with this being the Wild West, are there legit formal contracts being created between student athlete and business? Well, there are, but in the real small businesses who see, for instance, you know, again, you just run, you run the gamut in terms of business side. What, what's your advertising budget as a small business? <laughs> Does that, but is that budget large enough that you would want to pay someone like a lawyer to draw up a contract that says, I'll pay you for every social media post unless you do something that, you know, ha has conflicts with our yeah. definition of what is moral and good and, and yeah. just, or you stop playing or whatever. I, I mean, the, the contract you could draft up would be no different than a contract we would draft up for are a, a, a small business with another small business or employee or something like that. I, I can see a, a worst case scenario. And I guess this is my lawyer hat. You have an, a student athlete who's first string playing linebacker. They blow out their knee. They get, they have to go through all this rehab. They're not coming back to the school because I mean, to, to play because their eligibility is done, but they still are under an NIL deal with a local company but they have nine more months on this deal, but they don't post anymore. What's the business? How are they going to enforce it? How are you going to make them fulfill their side of the deal? And you've already paid X number of dollars or whatever. I can see some real tricky scenarios in their yeah. unfortunate situation. Yeah. Good luck suing a college student to enforce right. a contract. Right. Well, that's what I was getting ready to Right. <laughs> well, there, you, you mentioned something and I want to clarify something that I, I said. It is a violation of state law for anyone to make a contract contingent on participation mm -hmm. at, uh, you know, of, of in, in sports or right. contingent on that person actually coming to this, a, a particular school. Mm -hmm. So that's where you sort of get into the pay for play. Mm -hmm. Um, realm that the NCAA is trying to avoid. So, you know, while a small business could have a short, very short term deal mm -hmm. with an athlete that says, okay, over the next two months, you post a few times, I'll pay you 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. That's a relatively small risk if the student athlete doesn't perform. Uh, but what the small business can't do is say, for every game you start in, I'll mm -hmm. pay you and post, yeah. you know, so you got to start and then you got to post, right. I'll pay you $500. That, that would probably be a violation. Or if you if you rush for a thousand yards this year, we'll pay you a bonus at the end of the season. Exactly. And that's exactly. when we get into the professionalism that that's I right. know they're trying to stay away. All right, I got two more 
questions before we we get out of here. Sure. Um, first is is with me, Jay. I played in the the late '80s at Vanderbilt. Of course, way before any of this, my eligibility is is long since expired. Would I have any opportunity to go back to Vanderbilt and ask them for some type of a uh, a deal, uh, maybe with a local car company? Would I be eligible as a former athlete? That's an interesting point. Um, there are each school, well, I won't say each school, it is becoming more and more popular for alumni groups mm -hmm. to, ha to have go back to go back and ask for sort of NIL related opportunities. Mm -hmm. North Carolina is a notable example. They have a good alumni player group. Now, it's not a union, as I understand it. I mean, that's not exactly my wheelhouse, but it, you don't have to have 100% participation or anything like that. It's just a group of players can go back together. I don't know if you, perhaps Vanderbilt um, could tell you, Bernard, to go jump in a lake. I don't know. <laughs> well, they already have, Jay, I inquired. <laughs> You've tried? <laughs> yeah. There was a pizza place I loved in school, and they, they're long since gone, so those opportunities are well, exactly. that, that, that's a valiant effort, Bernard. And uh, I, I didn't know you played football. That's awesome that you did. You're, you're obviously a better athlete than I ever was. Well, I, I don't know about that, but I'll take the compliment. But thank you. <laughs> Jay, as we, we conclude, here's here's my, my real world scenario for, for Brockwell Smith and teaming up with one of the kickers at either Sanford or UAB. I'm trying to think of a slogan that after a made field goal or a great game, what would be the Brockwell Smith? And I know I'm putting you on the spot, but what would be a, a great slogan, a tagline after that long field goal has gone through the uprights? What um, would we be saying? <laughs> maybe, how about, we'd, we'd be aggressive. Maybe we'd say, you know, dominate your opponent. Something like that. I don't know. That's off the cuff. I, I, I think it, that- It wouldn't that, so much apply to a kicker though. No, no offense to kickers, but- <laughs> Well, it, and I think it would be tricky to, to partner up with, with field goal, any kind of kickers, because it's just, you never know what you're going to get with them. But I know what I got today. I got some real expertise. And Jay, I certainly appreciate you spending some time sharing a little bit of a glimpse, if you will. If we have this conversation two years from now, five years from now, it's going to be a completely different uh, conversation, because I think of the evolution of what you've alluded to that's coming into the future. Yeah, there will no doubt be um, a, an evolution, a metamorphosis. I, I mean, certainly, I, I, I think the most likely result, I don't know when it's going to happen. I thought it may have happened already. Well, con I think Congress will enact some federal law that will provide some uniformity that will probably give the NCAA and its members institutions a, a little more confidence and maybe more importantly, give the business community more confidence to invest in these players. Um, because, you know, right now, I think people are generally a little scared to get involved because they don't know what's coming down the pike in terms of what will be legal, what will be allowed and what won't be. Well, hopefully we get through this pandemic sometime in the near future and then Congress can make put this back on its priority list a little bit. But yep. Yep. guys, I've been talking with Jay Smith, Brockwell Smith Law Firm here in Birmingham. I'm going to put a link, Jay, to your law firm's website in our, in our uh, comments notes here. So if anybody wants to reach out to further this conversation, they certainly can do so. So thank you, Jay. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me, Bernard. It's been a pleasure talking with you. A absolutely. And, and as you guys have known for over four years now, Nomberg Law Lives on Tuesdays at 10 o'clock Central, 8 a.m. Pacific. Interesting conversations with their in their areas of expertise. And as you heard from Jay just now, he really is, he knows this stuff and it's such a unique, being a college football fan that I am, it really is in my wheelhouse. And I, I wanna thank him again for, for being here and educating us a little bit. Thank you, Bernard. Absolutely. And guys, please continue to be safe. Keep coming back each Tuesday. We're gonna keep doing this and uh, y'all have a good rest of your week. Take care. <laughs>